Great. Well, hello. My name is uh, my name is Rich. I didn't forget. I just uh, paused. And uh, it's great to see you. I'm an ordinant here at St. Paul Shadwell. Um, that means I'm trained to be a vicar in the Church of England. So that's a good thing. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm regularly assured. So, uh, And it's really great. I'm part of something called St. Melitus, which is an amazing thing. Sometimes I think that you... Um, People, we look at church history as trainers as to be a vicar, we look at church history. And I think there's moments in history where God does something. And I think the amazing thing about St. Melitus is that I hope that in years to come, that people will look back and say, that was a moment where the Church of England changed in such a way that actually God was able to break through in our nation. And so it's amazing, it's a real privilege to be part of that. And uh, it's great to be here at St. Paul Shadwell. Uh, we are looking at the moment at the contagious Christian. So hopefully in your connect groups you've been looking how to become a contagious Christian. And just exploring evangelism, that's all part of Invite 2012. It's an amazing opportunity for us as a church to think about who is it that we're bringing to Jesus? Who is it that we're sharing our, God, our faith with? What are we, where are we telling our testimony? And that's what really becoming a contagious Christian is all about. The first week... Rod spoke on um, having a contagious faith and the idea that everyone matters to God. Everyone matters to God. And then last week, we looked at contagious heart and what it means to share our faith from the place of faith. So that our faith, as we work out what that means for us, we share from that place. Well, today, we're going to be looking at contagious relationships. What does it mean to have contagious relationships? Relationships and relationships are powerful things, aren't they? I'm uh, from Sheffield. Now, in Sheffield, that would have got a little cheer. <laughs> Never mind. I'm from Sheffield. Okay. Well, it's, it's up to you guys. And um, <laughs> Sheffield is, of course, where um, the Lord resides. And um, I'm one of six children, which is quite a lot of children. And uh, in Sheffield, generally, the city is divided, d- divided in two ways. You have the blue and white half. There, we like to refer to them as the dark side. And then we have the red and white half, those of us who support Sheffield United. And my family is a family that have always supported Sheffield United. We are blades through and through. You know, my granddad, my great granddad, my dad, everyone. Except amongst my siblings. One of my siblings, I'll name him Matthew, he strayed from the flock. And he decided to start supporting the blue and white half of the city. It's no big deal. There's still, I still have four of the siblings who are from the right side of the city. But over time, what's happened is he started to co-opt my other siblings into this blue and white half of the city. And over the last few years, I've observed in my family two things happening. One, my, uh, one of my other siblings started going along to watch the blue and white half. We won't name them. And, um, and then recently, one of my other siblings has started going to watch the blue and white half, and they're getting more and more, I don't want to say militant about it, but, but kind of so passionate about it. They go every week, I get text messages, and for the first time in my life, I'm faced with the reality that in a few years, when they start having children, I may be overwhelmed by people from the blue and white half of the city, and not the red and white half. It's really bad, um, but it occurs to me that relationships are really powerful things, that actually what we do in our relationships is we influence people. We bring something out of ourselves to people. We share the kind of things we think about. And so as we look at contagious relationships today, what we're going to be looking at is who are the people we know, who are the people we used to know and maybe don't have as much contact with anymore, and who are the people we'd like to know. And as we think about those three groups of people, we're going to be asking the question, what does it mean for us to have contagious faith in those relationships? So I'd just like to take a moment and pray, but before we do that, let's just take 30 seconds to think about who are the people we know, who are the people we used to know, and who are the people we'd like to know. And let's just, as we wait for 30 seconds, just invite the Holy Spirit to come and just remind us of those people. I'll pray, and then we'll move into our passage. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the gift of scripture. We choose to sit under its authority this day. Jesus, we pray that as we read it, the Spirit, Holy Spirit, that you would make Jesus known to us. We pray that we'd know more of your kingdom. And that we would meet you here and glorify your name. 
In the name of the resurrected Jesus, everyone said, Amen. Fantastic. I'm just going to make this a little higher. Great. Well, we have this story in Matthew, Matthew 9, and it's an amazing story. It's so real. What's been happening is this. In Matthew, the narrative has told us that in the chapters before, in chapters 5 to 7, we have this story of Jesus and the, the, the record of Jesus' great sermon. And it's this amazing teaching. And, and so many people are inspired by this teaching that he gives in Matthew 5 to 7, the great sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. And as the narrative of Matthew's gospel moves on to chapter 8, we find in that chapter that Jesus is not just a wise teacher, but that he has authority. That he's the kind of teacher whose words are met by actions. So he brings healing to people. He starts to show that he's got authority, that there's, there's more to him than just wisdom. That there's more to him than just clever words. There's more to him than just good ideas. Here we have Jesus starting to act like the saviour. Starting to act like something else. Like maybe this person really is the messiah. And so we have chapter 8, and in chapter 8, as you'll see, he, he starts to do these amazing things. The faith of the centurion, he heals many. He starts to talk about the cost of following him. He calms the storm. He restores two demon-possessed men. He starts to show that not only is he a great teacher, but actually there's something more to him. Jesus becomes just he, he just seems to step into more and more of this ministry God has called him to him and, and God incarnate begins to reveal himself amongst his people. And then we have this story, and it's such a real story. These are real people. Sometimes we can read scripture and we can think, oh, they're really nice stories. But this is real. This really happened. There really was a paralyzed man. There really was a tax collector. And they really were Pharisees. And so as we look at this scripture, we're, we're asking the question, what, what is it about these relationships here that we find out? And I'd like to start by just asking a very simple question. What do the paralyzed man, the tax collector, and the Pharisee have in common with one another? Because on the outside, they seemingly have nothing in common. And yet I think if we look a little bit deeper, we can see that actually there is something going on in all of their lives that's quite similar and that Jesus speaks into. So first of all, we have this paralyzed man. Now, if you went to a primary school like mine, when you think of a paralyzed man, you'll probably think of, of a soft mat. And uh, when it says that the paralyzed man was on a mat, well, you'll think it's one of those sports mats. Certainly in my school, the way that was acted out as a, as a drama was you'd have some child who was paralyzed but still move it, moving, on a mat and smiling. And be, he would be dragged in to his friends and, and miraculously he would have to get off his soft gym mat and carry on. And, it, you know, I felt sorry for the boy that he was paralysed, although he didn't really look paralysed, what with all the moving. And, um, you, and although I felt that way, you kind of got this sense that actually he was, it wasn't that uncomfortable for him. And yet the paralyzed man in this story, this situation, is far worse. This is a terrible situation for him. His mat wouldn't be so soft. Had it not snowed, I'd have a crate to demonstrate that. But it snowed and the crate was too wet, so on your way out you can take a look. But if you imagine just a rough crate, it, it, a kind of a, a horrible mat, this is what this paralyzed man is, is, is stuck upon. He lives his life there. He's been, something's happened in his life that's driven him to this place of paralysis. Tom Wright says maybe he's got stuck. Something, sin has taken over him, regret, and he's, he's suffering a kind of psychological paralysis. Something in his life's turned him around. See, what happens is his life becomes bound. On each side of him, there's a boundary. And in front and behind him, there's a boundary. And that boundary is the mat. His life exists upon it he's totally bound he comes with this obvious weakness everyone knows what's happened to him everyone knows about his situation this man is helpless then we have the tax collector the tax collector on the outset looks a lot more comfortable 
Being a tax collector was probably quite a good business. You could, as people move from province to province, you would collect taxes for the occupying Romans, and then you could also add on your own little tax, and that way you earned a, a nice living. See, the tax sector on the outset looks very comfortable. And yet, I think when you think about his life, you see that he's equally bound. You see, being a tax collector in his world and in his culture and in his society meant that he was no longer included with the people of God. He was excluded. He was suffering a social exclusion. His choices, his choice to become a a tax collector, has led him to an exclusion from the people of God. And being excluded from the people of God meant being excluded from God. And so the tax collector lives his life outside of community. We read later that his friends are tax collectors and sinners. Other people who are excluded from the people of God. And you see, his life is equally bound. It's not as uncomfortable as the paralyzed man, but nevertheless, he's bound. His crate looks more like a tax booth, but nevertheless, it bounds him. He is unable to get beyond this social exclusion. The choices he's made have left him there. You know, in the, in the Second World War, at the end of the war, those who collaborated with the German occupying forces were treated really badly. They were treated so badly. If you've ever seen Band of Brothers, there's this amazing scene where they take one of the people who were collaborating with the German forces out of the city and they, they shave this woman's hair off. And it really shows the way they, they treat this person with vengeance. That's the kind of exclusion the tax collector experiences. Or... More recently, if you've followed the news, we've had two cases in the last week of bankers who've been on the wrong side of popular opinion. That's not a political statement, but that's something that's been happening in our society. There's actually two, two cases of bankers being publicly humiliated. Because what we do in society is we, we, we take vengeance sometimes. And so the tax collector is bound by his choice. He is unable to rejoin because his circumstances, this is who he is now. And although he looks comfortable, if you look a little bit deeper, I think you find someone who's excluded from society. Finally, there's the Pharisees. The Pharisees are the perennial bad guys of Scripture, or at least the New Testament. We all love to think about the Pharisees. They make us feel really good. It's slightly ironic. And... um, The Pharisees were a pressure group in their culture. They were pressurizing people. We need to live back by the Torah. We need to get back to basics. We need no no more of this sort of unclean stuff. None of this. We need to get back. They were a political pressure group. Some of them were priests, but lots of them were lay people. And they, they were there saying, we've left, so badly left the Jewish religion that we need to get back now. We, we really do. See, the Pharisees stand in quite a contrast in one sense, that they don't look excluded at all. They're the ones doing the excluding. And yet, and yet, when you come across them in Scripture, they continually miss the Gospel. They continually miss what Jesus is doing. See, they too are bound. They're not bound by a mat. They're not bound by a tax collector. It's booth. But they're bound by their misunderstanding of God. Their picture of God does not allow them to interact with Jesus. It doesn't make sense. See, each of these people are bound in some way. That's what they have, I would argue, in common. Most of the people we know, and actually ourselves as well, relate to those three positions. First of all, the paralyzed man. He is bound by his sin. He is so far, the consequences of the choices he's made in his life have led him to this place. We know loads of people who are in that place. 
the consequences they've made in their life. They just they're waiting for something. There are those, of course, who who are choosing to live in a way that looks comfortable, just like the tax collector. But in reality, there's a sense of lacking belonging, of lacking knowing I'm part of something. And then there are those whose picture of God is wrong. Whose picture of God has become misguided. Of course, we relate to those personally as people. You know, actually there's a challenge to each of us in those places. The question today is, how does this make sense in terms of mission and relationships? And what happens The question today is, how does Jesus meet these people? And what are the roles and what are the relationships at play there? Well, first of all, let's go back to the paralyzed man. He is brought to Jesus by his friends. He's carried in to Jesus. It's an amazing story. Think about it. He can't move. He can't bring himself to Jesus. And you see, Jesus has done this amazing teaching, as we've been thinking about earlier. He's done this amazing teaching in, in Matthew 5, 7. And no doubt his fame is starting to spread. People have heard about him. People are starting to say, not only does he teach in an amazing way, but he's also, he's also now he's also got authority to match it. It's not just teaching. It's not just words, but it's power as well. And the news of Jesus starts to spread throughout the villages and the towns. And, and there's a buzz about Jesus. And these friends, they hear Jesus has come in. And maybe they've watched this man for many years degenerate. And they start to think, well, maybe, maybe if we can do something with him, maybe if we can somehow get him to Jesus, then, then maybe there's just a chance for him. Tom Wright, who... Um, the former bishop of Durham, theologian, genuine good egg, he says this. He says this, and finally, they take their faith and they take their friend and they bring them to Jesus. They take their faith, they take their friend and they bring them to Jesus. Who are we bringing to Jesus? Who in your life needs to bring to, do you need to bring to Jesus? This week I had a phone conversation with a really good friend of mine. And he was explaining a situation in his life. And it was terrible. It was really bad. And I was thinking, I don't know what to say. That's quite unusual for me. But I, I genuinely didn't have anything to say. say and and I, I thought I could give you all the worldly advice in the world that I can think of and all my wisdom. And I could really try and help you out of this situation. But genuinely... The answer to the problems in his life, I can't bring. The only thing I can do is bring him to Jesus. Because that's the thing he's missing. It's so easy to find ourselves in these situations where we're saying, well, maybe if you just try this, or if you try that, or have you thought about this? But what he's really looking for what he's really looking for is the kind of change of identity that Jesus brings and the kind of purpose that he gives us. Who are you bringing to Jesus? And maybe today you need to be brought to Jesus. And maybe you relate to the paralyzed man. Maybe that's you. My encouragement is this, come. If you need someone to bring you, then get someone to bring you. Second, we have the tax collector. What's interesting about Jesus is with a paralyzed man, he goes to, he, Jesus comes to him and gives him exactly what he needs. He needs someone to say, get up and walk. He needs to know his sins are forgiven. He needs to be healed. Jesus does exactly that. The tax collector is excluded. He, I imagine he has a sense in which he doesn't belong. Jesus meets him, Levi, and says, follow me. The amazing thing about Jesus is he knows exactly what Levi needs. Follow me. Come and be part of what I'm doing. Come and be part of this. You're not excluded. You're included. You're not outside of the kingdom of God. You're inside of the kingdom of God. 
Come and be part of this. And Levi hears that message. My question for us as disciples, firstly, is this. Have we heard the message? Do you know you're part of something? Jesus says to each of us every day, follow me. He says it again every single day. Every single morning he speaks to us these words, follow me. Levi hears this message, this, this, this thing that says actually now your identity is not tax collector but disciple. And in hearing those words, what does he do? Well, he does what anyone at this time would do. He takes Jesus to his friends. And if you're a tax collector, your friends are tax collectors and sinners. So Jesus is taken by Levi to this great party This meal of people who don't belong. And Jesus is there saying, follow me. We don't know how many people chose to follow Jesus that day. You see, as we hear Jesus say, follow me. The challenge of Jesus to us is, will you take me to the people around you? To our friends. Now if your friends are tax collectors and sinners. Then they're the people we need to take Jesus to. To our workplaces. To our families. To our households. To the, our neighbours. The people we live our lives with. That's who Levi takes Jesus to. Who are those people for you? We go with this message. Follow Jesus. As a youth leader, I remember I, I had loads of kids who were in, um, in difficult situations. And one day I had this child, this, uh, this teenager, and he was, oh, he was such a scruffy kid. And uh, he'd been kicked out of house, his home when he was 13. And had, that causes all kinds of problems, as you can imagine. And we were sat at the end of Soul Survivor one day, and I thought, I have tried to explain to you my theology of suffering, good as it is, a number of times. And yet still you're not a Christian. No, I mean, I can, exp- I can explain it to you why, you know, there's a darkness and, and still, you're, you know, there's something else going on here. And we sat down and, and he said to me, you know, I just, I just don't know what to do anymore. I don't know that I can trust this. See, everyone in his life had left him. And it occurred to me in that moment that the only thing I was called to do was sit with him and say, Jesus, Jesus, follow him. See, we can get caught sometimes in these discussions, these ideas, these, these thoughts, I've got to try and work out your life for you. Where really all he was asking was, can someone bring Jesus to me? He wanted to be part of something, you see. So we have the tax collector. And then we have the Pharisees. And I would say that for, for, it's very easy for us to dismiss the Pharisees as the bad guys. But actually, if we're really honest, I think sometimes we probably relate best to the Pharisees and I say that about myself more than anyone else. Recently I was at a football game and uh, I was with my tribe and uh, we were watching this game and and, uh, this guy was going crazy at the referee. Absolutely crazy. And I was sat there thinking so glad that I'm more dignified than him. And and I I had these two guys with me uh, my brother and his friend and I really wanted to share Jesus with them. They're not Christians and I was thinking this is my moment. And for some reason instead of offering compassion or, or grace this guy, I thought, actually, I, re- I really want these guys to like me. So I was like, oh yeah, what a nutter, what a nutter. And, um, and on Friday, I found myself driving to South London. And driving in London is, is one of those things that really just infuriates me. And twice I got cut up by people in really big cars. And, um, and my reaction was just anger. And I thought, it's so funny, isn't it, that my anger is so funny that we can find ourselves going, oh, look at that guy. And then find ourselves in that position ourselves. So it's easy to dismiss the Pharisees. Jesus meets the Pharisees and offers them an invitation too. He says this, I want you to learn that I desire mercy and not sacrifice. That I've come for the sick and not the righteous. See, the Pharisees misunderstand God. They misunderstand the gospel. They've, They've... 
they can't relate to what Jesus is doing. Because of that, they're outside of the kingdom. And sadly, the Pharisees remain outside of the kingdom in this story. We see the challenge to us is do we believe Jesus when he says he can do it? No one's beyond salvation. I think the Pharisees sometimes they think people are beyond salvation. Sometimes I look at people and if I'm really honest, I think I, I think they're probably beyond salvation. And yet no one is beyond salvation until Jesus says so. Do we believe Jesus? Do we believe that he can go anywhere, that he can do anything, that by his spirit he can reveal the love of the Father to everyone? Do we believe it? Or do we find ourselves, as is so easy, thinking those people are just bad people? They're just, they're unredeemable people. Who is it in your life today that God the Father is inviting you to see differently, to see them as potential brothers and sisters in him. Timothy Carroll says this, the gospel says the people who know they're better, not more open-minded, not more moral than anyone else, are in. And the people who think they are on the right side of the divide are the most in danger. As we think through our relationships... Where is God calling us to go with grace? Where is he challenging? Where is he challenging our view of people? Where is he asking us to have a compassionate heart? Where is he saying, learn mercy instead of sacrifice? Learn that I've come for the sick and not the righteous. I think there are several ways to respond to this message and, and several challenges, really. And I think, first of all, there's the invitation. And I want to make that really clear. If, we're the, if we feel like they're the paralyzed man, if we feel like we're the tax collector, if we feel like we're the Pharisee, Jesus invites us this day. He says to the paralyzed man, get up and walk, your sins are forgiven. He says to the tax collector, follow me. And he says to the Pharisee, it's mercy, it's not sacrifice. And he says the same to us today. And then there's the calling that comes with that invitation, the challenge. And the challenge is this, who are we bringing to Jesus? They took their faith and they took their friend and they brought them to Jesus. Where are we doing that? The challenge is, who are we inviting Jesus to come and meet in our friends? Just like Levi did. And with the Pharisee, the challenge for us is, where is God calling us to change our picture of him so that we can change the picture of the world that we see around us? In a moment we're going to take communion which is exciting. Um, I'll pray for us, and then I'll invite Rick up. Father, thank you so much for this day. We thank you for your great love for us. We thank you for this invitation to know you, Jesus. Spirit, we pray that as we walk out this week, that we would know your kingdom, the principles of your kingdom, this upside down, wrong way up kingdom that doesn't always make sense to us, but which you call us to be your ambassadors for. Spirit, we pray you'd be with us this week. In Jesus' name. Amen.